All right, hello everyone. My name is Dr. Jasmine Goodman and welcome back to our second episode of Office Hours Career Pathways for PhDs. I am so excited to introduce you all to our guest. Her name is Dr. Savannah Young. She is a senior qualitative research analyst at Illumina and she is also a 2016 graduate of University of Georgia's PhD program for human development and family science. So give me one second and bring her to the screen. Hello. Hi, Dr. Young. How are you? Great. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for having me. No problem. So I have to always give background to just how we connected. So Savannah and I both connected on LinkedIn. We were in a very similar place while she graduated ahead of me. I finished in 2020. She finished in 2016. We were in a very similar place in terms of just figuring out what our next step, steps were going to be and just how we're going to navigate now that we have this degree. So what I would love to do now, I want to learn more about your journey um, I want to learn more about, you know, so when you started your program, what were some of the things that you wanted to, what were your career goals when you started your doctoral program? I'm smiling because it's just, yeah, you'll see. I mean, I start, so I'm, I'm somebody who went from straight through, I went, you know, graduated high school, went into college, had a psychology degree, and everyone told me, you have to do something, you have to keep going to school because you can't do anything with that, really. I was like, well, all right. And so there's a million other things I could have done, like looking back, maybe I should have traveled or done Peace Corps or something. But mm -hmm. I decided um, to seek out a, a graduate program because I kind of knew that that was something that I would eventually want to do. Mm -hmm. So just let's just get it out of the way now. Um, so and it was 2012. So, you know, the, everyone was, the job market was like recovering, but mm -hmm. I could just stay in school. And um, so I entered, I go, I went straight from undergraduate to graduate school. I went to University of Georgia um, from a smaller school in Georgia and uh, went into a program called Human Development and Family Science. So from psychology to that. And in this program were people who wanted to be child life, child life um, specialists, child life therapists in hospitals. There were people who wanted to be marriage and family therapists. There were people who wanted to just go into academia and like do social science research and study the families. And I thought, well, I guess I'll do that. <laughs> I guess I'll do this last thing. But maybe I really what I really want to do is create my own path. And I want to um, like work for the United Nations or something. That's mm -hmm. really what I wanted to do. Um, so. I entered, I went through, I started studying refugee issues because um, at the time that was when the Syrian um, conflict really started kind of happening while I was in graduate school and it just struck a chord with me. So I began to um, focus on refugee family issues and how really not issues in the bad way, but like how they find resiliency in, you know, resettlement. And so that was, that just really grabbed my attention and I thought it was very um, important, interesting data to collect. So I began to do that. And I thought, well, this is my focus area and I'm looking at my role models, which the way they talk, you know, at conferences and things and like the whole reason we're doing this. But at the time, my my role models were saying, you know, I'm an expert in this. You have to claim your expertise, mm -hmm. claim it. You have to claim your method methodological expertise mm -hmm. and you have to start using that to describe yourself because that's how you're going to, you know, market yourself. And so I, I tried to start figuring that out. Um, and then what that does to your brain is, or at least to my brain is, it kind of narrows me into thinking I can't, this is all I can do. And I think that's where um, I would, anyway, that's my first piece of advice is to, you know, remind yourself like you are more than just these few titles that you're encouraged to kind of lay upon yourself during graduate school. But yeah, that's what I wanted to do going into it, study or help the United Nations with uh, resettling refugee families. And so what changed for you at what point when you were in your doctoral program? Because I know you, we've talked at happy hour, you know, about just kind of what you observed about academia. So kind of yeah. tell me what were you observing at the time and what prompted you to to shift? Well, um, everybody, every experience, everyone's experience is different. And so but I think, you know, I was very naive. I was very young. I was, um, you know, in my early twenties. Um, and so I was looking at these peers of mine who were teaching me and they're not peers. They're, 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 they're role models for me. They're my professors. And 
even um, older graduate students and seeing them kind of complain a lot, but we were a safe place. So I just, but I absorbed a lot of those complaints, right? Mm -hmm. As uh, li their lived experience reality, like they're worried about getting tenure and that's all they're worried about. Um, they're not getting paid very much. It, and then they're, I saw, you know, I saw people's families suffering and that was hard for me because I was in a program that we were focused on understanding family systems and understanding the family. And none of that is, you know, was my um, personal experience, but I, I just thought, I don't know. I don't know about this career. Um, it's a little, the whole politics of like higher ed, mm -hmm. like distracts people. And I grew up with my mom, who's a teacher who also was, you know, I just grew up with like this understanding that the passion for teaching is, is such a service, but it's hard to escape the politics of the higher ed environment. Mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't ready to do that. And I, my actually, st my story to myself at the time was, I'm going to, I'm not ready to teach anybody anything. I'm, I've like learned a little bit about, some, about, I've learned a lot about one little thing, but I'm not ready to teach yet. And I've also, I'm also very young. So I thought I'm going to go out and like work for a while and then see if I want to come back to academia. So that's what I thought I would do. Um, and I still may, or I, I don't know, I don't see that in my future, but it's a possibility. Um, but yeah, at the time I just thought, this isn't something I can convince myself to do right now. Um, and I think uh, I need to go out and, and work like outside of the ac academy, you know? Yeah. And I think it's also important to embrace your life stage, embrace what you want your life to look like so that you can make a more informed decision because it, it's a lot. There's a lot to, you know, the politics of higher ed and, you know, some people love it. Some people don't love it as much, but it's important about knowing what works best for you and then taking steps in that direction. So once you defended your dissertation and you graduated, tell me what was your next step after that? Okay, um, well, so I graduated in May, 2016. I had gotten married in January of, oh. of that year. So I just gotten married. And um, so I had to make a decision with, with him now too. Um, and so, that was interesting. And so he, my husband decided he needed, what, what was he going to do? And I was going to try to like find a job wherever like he needed to be. And so he had a huge career shift and decided to enter a data analytics program. And so he applied to several programs and that season he found out, you know, he got accepted into these three and we had to make the choice, which one are we going to do? And then it came kind of, the decision came back swiveling to me, like, where can you get a job? And so yeah, I mean, it was kind of serendipitous and risky. We we decided to go into the program. He would go into the program in San Francisco um, and study data science and data analytics over there. And I was like, I'm like, I love to move around and travel and see new places. And so I didn't really want to go to Atlanta. And yeah. I was like, I'm to go somewhere different. Um, and so I started, I said, okay, San Francisco. And then once I latch onto something, I'm like, I'm all in. I'm going to do it. I'm committed. And so I started applying, you know, for a lot of, I, I applied for over 40 jobs in the nonprofit world, focused wow. on refugees, because I thought that's what I can do. Like I can study refugees in San Francisco. There's a lot, I mean, there's tons of refugees everywhere, especially over there. Well, so I'm applying for jobs, I'm applying for jobs. And like, I'm either, I don't know what they're thinking, because I never heard from anybody. Maybe I was overqualified. Maybe they didn't need they didn't need me, but I wasn't applying as like a researcher. I was applying as like a program coordinator and all these different positions, anything that had like a refugee uh, orientation towards it. Got it. Just to kind of build that experience. And I, um, I didn't hear from anybody. And there was at that time, there, 2016, there were not a lot of remote jobs like, like there are now. Right. Um, and so I didn't have a job. And so we, we moved out there, but I had this doctoral degree and my student loans <laughs> and we, <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And we moved out there and we lived in an Airbnb for about a month. And I was like, I'm going to find a job and I'm going to find us a place to live like or to rent. Mm -hmm. And that's what I, that's what I did. And I like just, you know, you just applied, 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 applied. Um, and finally on LinkedIn, which I can't say enough about LinkedIn, um, you know, gosh, yeah, I've gotten all of my jobs since graduation from LinkedIn, but this yeah. one, and it came up and it was, I mean, I, it was it was amazing because uh, it was called an ethnographic researcher was what this company was asking for. And it was a small consultant company um, in Redwood City, which is near, near San Francisco. And so I applied 
And I made this, and we didn't have a car out there. So I made this like three hour bus train walking journey uh, to the office in Redwood City that morning for my interview. Cause I had an interview on the phone and then I got to go in person and I just like manifested it. I was like, I'm going to get this job. Like I have to get this job. Also, I have no idea what this job is. Like they want to, what's a, cons- like, I didn't even know what is a research consultancy. Nobody in graduate school had talked to me about that, right. about corporate right. research. Like I was like, but I, all I know is I can do ethnographic research. So right. <laughs> put me to work. So question for you, how did you translate the academic speak to consulting speak? How were you able to convince them that you were the right person for the job? Well, I don't know how it is now, but for me, I did not do that. Like I, cause I had no tools. I, mm-hmm. I went to this interview. I was completely, I tried to be my very best academic professional expert self. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, like it was, let me just set the scene. It's like four men in their fifties who are the principals. There's six people total who work here. Four of them are men in their fifties and one man in his later thirties. And then I walk in, in my early twenties from the South. Okay. Um, ne- didn't know what a research consultancy was. Um, and so I'm just like, I'm in my suit, my suit though. And I'm like ready to convince them and I'm ready to make this happen. So to your question about like, how did I translate? I didn't do it that day because I didn't know what the language was, but Mm -hmm. I was able to, um, you know, I I would just, I leaned into what I, what they were asking for, which was someone who could do research and who was willing to learn this other stuff. And I was like, I was very much willing to, you know, learn anything new. And I, and I was very excited about it, um, about a new opportunity that wasn't academia. So I, I tried to make that very clear. Um, and then throughout my career, career there, I picked up the language. I was like, oh, it was like a whole nother. It was like an MB, mini MBA. And I was like, whoa. I, OK. And yeah. so how long were you in that first job? Um, it was about two years. OK, so talk to me about some of the challenges that you faced in that role. So coming from a purely academic background, you're now interfacing with people they have massive budgets, you know, they're doing this really public facing work and, you know, they're concerned not just with the quality of the research and the impact, but also with, you know, the bottom line and making money. What mm-hmm. were some, you know, challenges either internal or external that you faced in that role? I faced a lot of challenges, like go just really this idea of business and KPIs and, and making a deck that isn't, they aren't interested in the literature review, like at all, at mm. all. Um, we spent, you know, like that's 60, 40, you know, that's like a big piece of it. Why do we even need to know this? And so they knew why they need to know it. And it, just coming up with like, I didn't know what an RFP was. I didn't know what a KPI was. I didn't know what a, what I was worth. I didn't know, you know, a project, like I had no idea what a project cost. And it's actually, you know, it took me a little while to kind of see that I had to, I had to really, you know, convince the principals a little bit, like, I want to learn, like, how do they, what's an RFP? Like, can I read it? Um, I want to understand what they're asking for. And then I would see the budget or the cost. And I was like, whoa, like they're paying a lot of money for this. Yeah. This is real. Like they, they that, and then that reassured me of the value of my um, contribution. Mm-hmm. So, um, but just navigating like all the business speak, like that was a very vulnerable place for me. I didn't understand it. So any time that happened, I, I sort of, um, I just tried to ask a lot of questions to the people I trusted there, which it was everyone. But, um, you know, you find one or two people who can really translate it for you and um, listen and learn. I tried to read stuff, but I didn't know what to read. Um, Looking back, I really would have like loved someone to give it, have given me some, some media to read and consume about business and how to speak. So um, this is great that you're doing this. Yeah. So now once you, you finish with the consultancy, you shift to a new position. And in this role, were you doing UX research at this time? Yeah. So at the consultancy, right, I was like, uh, it was like a, they called themselves a design research firm. Okay. And now that term is very ubiquitous. But in 2016, it was a little less ubiquitous. And it was, um, they had been doing this for like over 20 years. So they, wow. they really were, um, you know, foundational in this, this little consultancy and they're well connected. So that, but none of them were like researchers. They came from like architecture and design. That's where they came from. And so they hired a couple of us to help with kind of bolstering the academic research side of it. Um, but anyway, so I became like, I, I started 
the second year, um, I started shifting how I viewed myself and like I, I redefined myself on my resume and everything from ethnographic researcher to um, design researcher. Okay. I started like figuring out like that was a term I had never heard. And I started figuring out what that was and reading job descriptions like, yes, this is a thing and I can do this. Okay. Um, what is so that? then okay. what? So what is a design researcher quickly? Because I'm not sure I fully understand the term either. Yeah, well, you know, at the time it was like in the Bay Area, it was a really it was a term that people were using to describe somebody who um, uses research on people, um, on the environment, on the customer or the market to inform the design of whatever it is. Of it. And, and, and you can be really flexible with that, like design of your product, design of your environment, um, design of your strategy, like all of those things. But you're but it's a businessy term. Mm hmm that's like almost, you know, related exactly to like the liberal arts. Research. Yeah. So, got it. Got it. Okay. Um, but yeah, so then I moved, then I made a transition to work for the general insurance as a, um, well, they were hiring for, okay, this is another weird one. They were hiring for an empathy researcher, okay. empathy researcher. And I was like, and this is 2018. So I'm like, what am I? Like, what is, what is my title? Someone tell me, please. So like, this is like a theme, you know, um, but it doesn't matter your title. Like I had to really lean into what are my skills and what can I do and what do I want to learn more about? Um, and so I knew I, I'm, I'm a very empathetic person. So that, that And that title just caught my attention, empathy researcher. And I read about it and I thought, OK, they want somebody who can do qualitative, mostly qualitative um, research and study the um, Hispanic marketplace um, and help them kind of innovate. But I got there and within three months, uh, that job was gone. Um, and they moved me into the marketing department where I wasn't. I was not in the marketing department. I was in like a little, um, you know, like innovation hub that they had. Okay. But that kind of fell apart. And so they moved me into the marketing department. And I was. they were like, you're going to be a market researcher now. We don't have any of those. Can you be that? And I was like, OK. Also, I'm pregnant. I'm like uh. with my second child. So, yeah, uh, I, I was like, now I'm a, now I'm a market researcher. And so it's like this theme of like, you know, just own your skills and you can plug them into all these different titles. Like, are you curious? Can you understand the customer? Can you then think about and what the first job at the consultancy taught me is, can you apply those thoughts to like some really interesting ideas that push the business forward, that push people to think forward a little bit? Then that's what you need. That's what I had. And right. so that's where I became kind of like studying the, the, the insurance market. Okay. And so at this time with you being sort of, I would say a generalist in the sense of that you're not just focused on one specific industry, how was there ever any like tension from wanting to still have that academic rigor versus being able to, you know, thrive in a, a corporate environment because academic research and commercial research, they're not the same. You know, you can try and as much as you possibly can, but you know, timelines are different, budgets are different. So how are you able to maintain the perspective that you learn within academia while working in a very fast paced environment? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, because I'm curious, like, I want to hear it from your listeners. Like, how do they do this? Because for me, it was like a little bit of, um, I'm not going to lie. It was a little bit of survival at first, but you go from, like you said, like almost um, drinking from the fire hose with like, data quality and the, and the, and the ethics and everything like that's all, that's, that's it. That's the most important thing. I, or I'm not going to listen to any of your results Yeah. to a design, a design research firm where we had multiple clients who just assumed we would take care of that. Like that's not something they need to answer to that's on us. And, right. and luckily um, our firm was very, very, very attuned to that. Um, but I can see how that could fall apart. So then going into kind of, leading the only research at this insurance company, like the first time they've done consumer research, really. Mm -hmm. um, so I was like, I felt like I, if I don't, if I don't bring these kind of ethics and this data need for data quality into the conversation, mm -hmm. into our conversations with vendors and partners, like, what are you asking? Then it's not going to get asked, right? Like, right. if we don't ask, if I don't ask it, it's not going to get asked. But luckily, um, I did have some um, like my VP at the time, and now she's the CMO, um, I think, of American Family, Alicia Azali. But she 
she was also extremely attuned to kind of the need for high data quality and ethics. And so she kind of encouraged me and the people I worked with to make sure that was infused into the vendor relationship, like make yeah. sure it's there and then we can go from there. Like that's a baseline, but um, the rigor itself, like that's something that I think does fall down. Like it falls, it, it falls because of the timelines. It falls because um, of, well, I guess it's a lot about the timelines and I'd have to think more about why, but, but you have to just, you have to kind of set your, where, what are you not willing to sacrifice right. for the sake of the research? And, mm -hmm. um, and also you have to provide your limitations just like when you, you know, present your academic research and business people don't really like to hear that, but you always need to say like, here's a list of caveats to this research. This is what we heard from this group of people at this time, blah, 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 like really emphasize the sample um, while also trying to like make your case, like this is what, this is the best we could do here. It's hard. Yeah. Now talk to me about your current role. So once you transitioned from the general, you moved into like the life sciences, bio, biotech space. So that is a big jump, but tell me what was attractive about moving into this industry in this uh, position in particular? Um, yeah, so I kind of became like, I really feel like I became an expert on insurance, at least for the population, for the general insurance, like that group of people we were studying. Like I really, me and my, my small team, we really, um, I, I felt like I knew a lot about those people and like what, why they buy insurance and how to keep them and how to attract them and what's important to them. Um, so I was a little nervous to then kind of leave that, that expertise area. Um, for a whole new industry called, you know, genetics, which is, I work now for Illumina and it's a biotech company who creates technology and machinery and scientific advancements for the study of genetics. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a B2B company primarily, not B2C too. Um, and so there's B2B oh, is business to business versus business to consumer. So they work with other businesses who then have in clients. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's another word. They're right. So yeah, I'm not like, inter I'm not typically working for, you know, the end customer. It's like a, it's another business, like a hospital or a lab or something. But what attracted me? Well, that's such a hard question. I mean, there were several things I was like, I was kind of the only researcher at the general insurance and it was a, it was a bit of, it felt, it started to feel a little bit heavy. They started to need a lot of expertise too in um, like quantitative data analytics that I just didn't really like own. And I felt like I needed to, I wanted to own something um, that I could really provide a lot of more value. So I, I think if I'd have stayed, I think there definitely would have been a place for me there, but I just felt the, the tug, like, I think my time here is, is done. Sounds Maybe I should try something else and not for them, but like for myself, I wanted to keep growing yeah. and I wanted to lean back into like, really interesting qualitative problems because that's what's something that I just value. So this, um, I was kind of, I put myself open to work on the LinkedIn. Cause we LinkedIn here. We love them. They we love it. great for jobs and building community. Yeah. If you embrace it, it can help you. It helped me. Um, but I started looking and, um, applying for jobs for about a year, honestly. Um, and I just wasn't going to rush. Like I was going to try to find something, the right one, but also I was starting to feel like, okay, I really do need to like move on. I think, you know, a year later, like, okay. And um, so this kind of, I guess they call him headhunter or whatever, recruiter person from a third party reached out to me and he said, uh, and I started, you know, playing with my title on LinkedIn, that title, oh. it's like, it comes back, you know, yeah. like, I started seeing different, um, different titles for jobs come out there. Like there's design researcher, there's mixed methods researcher, there's qualitative researcher. What do you, what, how do you want to express yourself? How do you want to market yourself for the sake of this like recruit recruitment phase of your career? And so um, I, I said, well, I really want to lean into qualitative research. So I'm going to, I'm going to push into that. And that's what this recruiter said he was looking for. He said, my client's really looking for an, a qualitative expert. Now I thought this guy was fake. So I actually stood him up, you know, you get those fake ones. So I stood him up the first time he wanted okay. to talk to me. And then like a month later, um, he reached out again. Like, I still, I really think you might be a good fit. Can we just have a conversation? And I was like, okay. And I really didn't take it very seriously. I thought he was, I, I really didn't think it was a real thing. 
Uh-huh. But um, but we, but we did, and it was a real thing. And so I said, "Well, what is this business like? Your client? Like, what is it? Who is your client? <laughs> I, don't, I don't like this like ambiguity." Right. And so then he told me, and I was like, "Oh, well, like I've never heard of them." And I started looking at, "Is this a real company and everything?" And of course, it it was. Um, but they were hiring for a. They wanted at the time they really wanted a qualitative researcher, and they wanted somebody who was like who could own that qualitative research methodology they want they wanted like to just have somebody who who had the phd the rigor was like included like it's all in a box like if you hire that person they're going to include rigor they're going to include expertise and then we and having business um having a little bit of business experience is nice but like make sure that person is just like has publications and all these things and that was kind of interesting and unique and i don't know i haven't asked them why they were looking why they were so strict about that. Cause he said they were, they turned down a lot of people, but he wow. actually told me, you know, your resume is kind of generalist looking, like you mentioned, you know, it says you can do a lot of different things. Cause I, I could, I could do like, I could do some quant I could do, but I didn't like lean into my call. So I, asked, I redid my resume. He said, redo it. Like put all your pubs on there, put all your experience doing qual on there. Mm-hmm. I was like, okay, are you sure? And I did. And it was like two pages and it looked really healthy. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's what got me my interview. And then, they, you know, we, we moved forward. So, but that's how that worked. So our next segment is called Nuts and Bolts. And that's where we talk more about, you know, what specifically that you did. And so you mentioned how you played around with your title on LinkedIn. That does help. I noticed that when I changed it from, you know, all of these different things that I was affiliated with to just qualitative researcher, the number of invites I would have to connect and then also to talk about either job or contracting opportunities changed. So what are some things specifically that you did that helped you to move forward? So you changed the LinkedIn title. Um, I did also notice on your LinkedIn that you highlighted your key skill sets. So you would talk about written communication, you would talk about interviewing and all these different things. Um, Tell me more about, you know, just how you were able to communicate that. Let's see. It was, it was definitely, um, the LinkedIn edits got me the recruiter interview, but I'm not sure that the, um, manager, the hiring manager ever looked at LinkedIn. I'm not sure what she looked at. I know was my resume okay. um, and maybe the recruiter's notes or something. Maybe she looked at it. I'm not sure. Okay. But, um, so in the, you know, I studied, he, he I had this conversation with him. I, I, I was kind of critical, like of, like I pushed him, you know, the recruiter, I said, like, I'm not sure this is going to be the right fit for me. You know, I was a little bit doubtful of myself because moving into genetics, like I can't, I haven't done that before. I said, are you sure they, they are, they understand that I'm not a scientist, like a a, a lab biological scientist. Mm -hmm. He said, they don't care. Like they want, you can learn that stuff. They they want, I said, okay, like if you're telling me that, then I'll move, you know, I'll, I'll at least give you my resume and I put my best into it. And so the resume and the LinkedIn are the two things that I've, I used as my tools. And then I didn't do any networking for this, for this opportunity other than like putting myself out there on LinkedIn. But for other interviews I had, I had a lot of other interviews. Like I got, you know, I got to the second or third call with a lot of like big tech companies and it it was just not the right fit, but I did try to network on LinkedIn. I started adding people um, at companies with titles that I thought were interesting and were help were something that I could see myself doing. I mean, I was, you can't, you can't be embarrassed. Like that's what that's for. Yeah. And people yeah, yeah. are flattered by it. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a couple of conversations with um, people like, like a couple of people at Facebook who were doing, who were, who were qualitative researchers. I had some like information interviews with them because I had ended up doing a full interview with going through that process. Um, and yeah, so those are things that I did. I was just sort of like, I try to just be uh, not, not embarrassed and, and, and open, but also put my best self forward. It was exhausting. Like it's exhausting to go through that for a year. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And so with that, when you are talking about your experience, how walk me through your process for communicating your research value, like end to end. So let's say, and the reason why I'm asking this question is because a lot of times if a doctoral student doesn't have a lot of commercial research experience, they look to their research project or their dissertation to show that they can manage a research project. So how, what are some ways that you, or you would mm-hmm. recommend a doctoral student, recent PhD graduate, 
how should they communicate their project management experience, their research design experience when talking about a research project that may be outside of commercial research? Well, I'm, a, I'm not really like, I know that, that people do this and I, I didn't do this exactly into, except for my first job with Point Forward. Cause after that, I started using examples from corporate work. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that in, at least I've read in the, in the Facebook, they have, Facebook has a lot of resources for like academics transitioning. Um, mm -hmm. And they, they have a lot of good examples and blogs and everything you can read. So I just have consumed a lot of that trying mm -hmm. to understand what, these companies wanted to hear how, how to put that story together. Mm -hmm. And it is, I think the more you practice telling that story, the better and easier you, you get at doing it. Um, but there's a method called the star method. And uh, I haven't actually, I can't remember what it stands, how, what each letter stands for. Situation, Do you remember? Situation, task, action, and result, I think. It sounds we'll right. Put on the screen for those who are going to watch yeah. this, and we'll put a link in the comments. Yeah, mm -hmm. link it in the comments because actually, um, I tried to use that. I mean, it was people in feedback were like, "You need to use the star method." So it was a very tangible, tactical thing that a lot of people told me to do in my um, storytelling. But I picked about two. You know, you read the job description, you try to understand what you know. The first thing the, the hiring manager, whoever does, is let me tell you a little bit about this job, mm -hmm. and then you know, you have your stories, you might have five or six stories you can tell, but you only have time to tell two stories or one story. So you think you have to do your researcher, you put your researcher hat on, like, what is it that they're looking for? And what do they need to hear? I have five stories to choose from. Um, okay, I'm going to tell the story about creating the roadmap, because they're really interested in strategy. I'm going to tell them how I thought about the roadmap and communicated that to the business partners. Or if you're in academia, and you've done like, a couple of major research projects, you can break those up. Like, don't just tell them, you know, this was my dissertation, like break your dissertation up. Like it was a lot of like 10 different steps, 10 different problems you had to solve. Well, I was, I was interviewing a very vulnerable population. Um, mm -hmm. You know, my, my participants in my research were ex um, people who had been in prison mm -hmm. and had come out of prison. And I was trying to do interviews with them. And this is how I figured that out. And like, tell that story. Don't worry about the results. Like, I just, I guess my tactical experience or advice would be like, and I've I heard this from somewhere else, but um, type out your, your individual story and break it up into pieces that you can tell to make your point. Mm -hmm. um, and each little piece, you know, okay, that's the story. That's the interesting nugget of my experience. But like, what was the result of that? And that way you can communicate that. And not only does that help you maybe like land a next interview or land a job, it leaves an impression, but it's, it's like that person can tell a story. They can give me one piece of information and a result. And I need that. You need that when you're doing research in corporate environment. Right. And that's one thing also, too, is and I thought it was the same way with my dissertation defense. The committee wanted to know, OK, you do the research, but walk me through your process. What informed your decision making? You know, yeah. they want to know. And even with hiring managers, they want to know that if we give you a project, we can trust you to own that project and that you will be strategic and diligent in the types of decisions that you're making. So it's less about the research is important, but it's also about your approach to the research. And they want you to be able to think quickly on your feet in order to, you know, just move the project forward. So our next segment is called A Day in the Life. And so I want to learn more about, you know, you're in your job now. Tell me on a typical day, let's say, they come to you with a new project idea. They're looking for you to kick it off. What's that look like from, let's say, 9 a.m. to when you start till end of day? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So for me, if I get, you know, asked, um, you know, OK, we have a new stakeholder problem. Um, this is what they want to do. I'm going to forward you this email. <laughs> and so I get this forwarded email chain. And typically at this point, you know, I'm. Um, at this point, I've been at the company about a year, close to getting closer to a year. So a few people know who I am, but a lot of people still don't know who I am. So I'm reading through this like long email chain, trying to understand like that's your lit review, that's your <laughs> background, and you know it's like one sentence. Like we need to we need to learn more about so and so in <clears throat> in China. Can you do we know anything about this? And mm -hmm. then like a few emails later, they end up 
understanding that we don't know anything about that. We need to do more research. Mm-hmm. And that's when I get forwarded this email. Um, so sometimes I try to like just consume all of that. Um, maybe I'll kind of reframe it all. Like, okay, this is the problem they're trying to solve. This is what we have. These are resources we have. These are people involved. I look up all those people that are involved on that email thread. Like what department are they in? Who do they report to? And then I, I try to like explore the, the online company website to figure out like, what is that team's mandate? And how does that ladder up to the strategy of the company? Because all of that, if I don't know them, helps me understand what's important to them. Because wow. then um, we might set up a call, right? To under, and, and in the call, it's my job to pull things out of them that they, like that, that one sentence or two sentences, they didn't include. Why do you need to know this? Okay, that helps me understand the timeline. Okay, why do you, why do you need to know this again? Oh, well, that helps me understand who exactly we need to talk to because there's like a there's so many different criteria and we have to narrow it down. So, I'm it's a lot of like this is the problem and then trying to figure out all the pieces that are missing by like doing my own kind of desk research like who they are and what their problems are. And then we have a we might have a call if I'm lucky it'll be like later that day, um, and it's usually only thirty minutes. And the call is, you know, okay. And it's them just kind of repeating, like, I forward you this email, like, did you get it? And also, like, we really just need it on this. And how much is it going to cost? Mm-hmm. And um, so, you know, you have to be prepared with those sort of tactical information. You might follow up. Obviously, you always follow up with a, um, action. These are the things I'm going to do. These are the things I need you to do to, for, to move on to next steps. You try to have a decision at the end of that 30 minutes. And you try to just, my, 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 my manager now is really helping me understand, like, how to impress upon stakeholders the that if we want to have high quality data, which we do, it's very important to us as we're building this research practice. Um, that you know, there's a certain there are certain things I'm going to need from you. There's a, I'm going to need allowances for time. I'm going to need allowances for conversations with you to make sure that this is actually what you want, you need. You're going to have to put in the work, and so um, that's what we're really working on building. But After that call, you know, you follow up and maybe I'll put together a draft of a discussion guide or like a draft of kind of these are the problems we're trying to solve. This is who kind of the the, the statements of like of work Um, that that might happen. And that's that's that would be a really big, great day that those typically happen over like a week. But Mm -hmm. that's sort of how the pattern might work. And that's one thing I've noticed. So I come from an agency background. You come from client side. And so. In our initial conversations, it was great to learn or gain that client side perspective about, you know, you identify a research need, but there's still a process to get to, you know, a fully realized, you know, RFP for, you know, external agency or a statement of work. And it does take a lot of, I would say, maybe managing up to understand because people know that research needs to happen, but they're not always as clear on all of the processes and questions yeah. that go into, you know, developing the right question and having the right guy. Because what you never want to do is get into, you start fielding and you might have the right guy, but the wrong person, or like that would be a nightmare. So there's a lot that comes along with that. And I think I would equate that to, in a way, managing relationships with like your dissertation committee and being able to, you know, give that person the respect they deserve, but then also kind of challenge some of the things that are being said, because you want to make sure that you have what you need to be successful on the project. Yeah. And and like, I would just add to that, you know, sometimes I don't know how it would translate to the academic uh, field, but I think you could, you know, think about bringing to your major professor, or your committee, like, Okay, so far, you know, if they're kind of detached from you, maybe that would happen sometimes. Yeah. And they're not really paying attention because they have a lot of, they're worried about tenure, they're worried about all their pubs or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Um, But you kind of, I I bring for my stakeholders, I often, like, this is what I heard you say. So if I go out and I interview 20 of these people and I bring back answers to these five questions, is that going to help you? Or is Mm -hmm. that, and and so in in the academic frame, you might say, you know, all right, well, this in a, like one page or this is what I'm going to do. And it's going to tell me X, Y, and Z. And I'm going to be able to publish in this mini journal, or I'm going to get like four articles out of it. And I, I think these journals, like look ahead and present to them what, what they're going to, what you're or they're going to get at the end of this six months or three months. Right. And say, is this it? Because like so far I've been sort of like, this is what I've gathered. Like, let's check right. this. 
by mm-hmm. like presenting a hypo- hypothetical situation to them. I, I do that with my stakeholders. Like, all right, this means I'm not going to talk to these people. This mm-hmm. means you're not going to have, you're not going to have answers to all these things. You're going right. to have an answer to this. Mm-hmm. Is that helpful? And like, mm-hmm. it kind of makes them see it from retrospective. Cause I'm telling you like 2020, everybody's like, well, you know, we really should have been talking to these people, but you didn't really hear me say that. Like, no, no, no. Let's check <laughs> this now. So. Yeah, is and it's important to to also you know ask questions. That's why they brought you on the team, gain clarity, and also gain alignment. And there's you have to almost put yourself in a vulnerable position, as you mentioned, because you're still learning that environment, but they're also still learning how to work with a PhD if they've never worked with one before. Totally, so, yeah. You know, there's a different level, level, like you said, the rigor, the ethics and all of that. So it's about, you know, everyone giving each other grace as you learn, you know, what that process and what their research practice will look like. Yep. All right. So we have a segment that we love called Mentorship Moments and Words of Wisdom. Now, I know that you did recently give a presentation at your alma mater, just kind of sharing some of your experiences. So when you are in front of, you know, someone who's desperate, someone who's crying out for help because they're not quite sure, you know, what step they're going to take next. What what are some words of wisdom or comfort that you like to share? I can just remember being that person in graduate school. I had a a colleague and I'll I'll uh, shout out to Bertrana Adams right now. She's amazing. And she, I was, af- it was after like, you know, a quantitative, like quant three, stat three or whatever class. Okay. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's hard for some of us. Um, and I was just like, I can't do this. And I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to be able to be anything or anybody. And this is just too hard. And I was crying, mm-hmm. but she, um, she just encouraged me and she was like, you know, you don't have to be able to do everything. Like we, we need each other. You're really, really, you have to lean into what you know how to do really well. And we're going to get through this other stuff together. And you're, we're just going to like hold hands and get through it. Um, but that's sort of like I do. And I have, I have so many thoughts around this, but I think for myself, I'm always dealing with kind of this idea of self doubt. I think academia comes with a lot of self doubt, like, because you have to, convince so many people that you're doing something the right way with the right people. You're, you're an expert. And if you're, if you're not like a full expert and you know everything, then for some reason you're like seen as less valuable Mm. and that doesn't allow much room for like growth and learning. And I think that's a problem, but I do encourage people to lean into what they do know. And so you might not know everything about the, the, people you're studying and, or the theory that you're leaning into, you're using the theory to learn, but you you do know how to tell a story and you do know how to learn, you know, how to strategize, you know, how to make really hard decisions with the best information you can. So like, I encourage you to lean into what you know how to do, not like what you know, you know, like what you know is, is good and interesting and has probably contributed um, like your academic SME knowledge, uh, SME, like a subject matter expert, you know, like for me, refugee resettlement in, in Georgia and in Israel, like those were two populations that I studied and I published. And I know a little bit about that, but I haven't studied that in about 10 years. So, Mm -hmm. or, you know, eight years. So, um, I know less now, like I'm not the expert on that anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's okay because I'm still, I didn't like lose anything. So I just want to encourage people what, you know, at that moment, is, is great, but it's, it's how, it's what you know how to do that right. is going to get you that, get you through your career and you're going to keep learning how to do new things. And that's, that's just part of it. But like, don't fear leaving that content behind, like, or letting it be part of your story. Cause it is. Um, and if you go into, if you continue into academia, obviously like you just build upon that content and you learn how to do new things. But you know, if you move into corporate research or, you know, as a researcher yourself, Jasmine, like you're constantly, you know how to interview people really well. You know how to listen and how to tell that story. But you talk to people about like a hundred different things every year. You're not like an expert on any of them. So that's what's more important. Yeah. And you're right. The one place or the one way that I found my confidence was realizing that it's really not about me. It's about what I can do. So it's not about how much I know about a subject. It's about my process for finding answers for the, the client. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so, and, and that makes it fun because now it's like, okay, well, this is just, you know, a journey of discovery. I don't have yeah. to, you know, yes, I have this degree, but I don't have to know all the answers to everything they're asking me for because, you know, that's not how any line of academic inquiry works or commercial research works. You, it's a process to learn. And so once I, you know, because I suffered with imposter syndrome in my first role because I was like, what am I doing? I don't know. They're looking at me like I should say all these PhD things and I'm still trying to just learn the, the process of market research. But I had to realize that, you know, I know how to find the answers. Just mm -hmm. focus on, you know, the skill set that the degree has provided and lead with that. And even my, my yeah. manager at the time, she said, lean into the fact that you're a PhD. Don't try to hide it. You know, that's what makes you unique. And so I would definitely encourage everyone to, you know, realize that you don't have to know, you know, it doesn't have to be a mile deep, you know, for your, in terms of your subject matter, but you know how to do research and just focus on that. You know how to identify a problem, you know how to find the answer, like, mm -hmm. and you're not, you're not afraid to talk to different people, get, look at different data sets, put the right. story together and, and then tell people about it. You know how to tell people about it in a succinct way. Um, the so, is insane. Like yeah. I've worked on projects from public health to pharma to financial services. I just finished a project for an automotive company and I'm just like, it's the exact same process. So, but I, if you, it seems so intimidating to when when especially when the project managers are so just like okay we have this can you do this thing and they know what's going on but you're still trying to feel your way through the process but once you're in it research is research if you can just get navigate past like the project management side of things and i've been blessed to work with some really great project managers that they love that role and i could just focus on the mm -hmm. research because okay. when i was doing a pm role i was just like i i don't know what this is everyone needs things and no one's responding so it was a lot so yeah and um, there's there's a lot of different ways, but I think the the core thing here is you know standing on the confidence and the skill set that you have gone through this three four five year however long process to work towards this degree and know that it really is not as hard as people may think that it is honestly in my opinion the PhD was a hard part that <laughs> that was a hard part and then just with the leaning into resources, then you're able to translate that into commercial research. Now, do you have any final thoughts as we wrap up our interview? Is there something that we maybe should have talked about that we didn't or any just final moments that you'd like to share? Um, I would just say, you know, it. there's, <laughs> I don't know how you feel, Jasmine, but for me, like, it's not, it's, there's nothing worse than like, seeing somebody on LinkedIn or wherever they post about their new job who, who makes you feel like they know everything, right? Like I don't want to, if I'm hiring, which eventually, hopefully I hope to be somebody who hires somebody, but I don't want to hire somebody who knows how to, who knows everything. Yeah. I want to hire somebody who is excited and curious and willing to do new, hard, interesting, learn new things. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think that's the biggest, like, shift coming from academia when you're when to get that pub publication or to get that partnership or the postdoc or public or a share at a conference like if you don't just sell your soul out in terms of like you know everything and don't question me then it's like not as respected and I think you you know personally my advice is like try to um, use that as a tool when you need to in academia right like you might need that but you know, oil the gears on this other tool, which is curiosity and openness yeah. and willingness to be wrong and willingness to learn. Because mm -hmm. in when a bit a, a hiring manager in the corporate world is looking to hire somebody, um, they want to know you know you you know how to think and you know how to solve problems. But it's kind of a put off when I think somebody comes in like they know everything, yeah. um, because in the corporate world, like you know er, that is its own little culture and hub, and you need to realize unfortunately that those people have the power coming you come in and you're coming in to learn from them and right. to contribute you know but be part of something and you're you're not having to fight all the time like in academia i think so it's just like a culture shift a mind shift and i think just use it as a tool when you need it in academia because you do need it mm -hmm. and then be willing to put that sword down and pick up the other tools over here right yeah curiosity i think 
when I think back on my time at an agency, I was the most excited about a project when other researchers were like, oh my gosh, this is great. Like we were all just excited to just, you know, attack this problem from just different perspectives. And so I absolutely agree. That's a great way to view that because a lot of times and sometimes, you know, that person is coming in with, you know, I have a PhD. I know all the things. Other times I think it's just that people are maybe overcompensating for yeah. what they think, you know, how they should you know, maneuver and interact with people. And so it does help when you just, you know, you got the degree, you don't have to remind everybody you have it, just sit it to the side. We know you have the skill set and just focus on just the curiosity and wanting to just explore just different paths to the work. So, well, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for joining us today. And how can people connect with you? Or I know we'll be providing a link to a resource that you mm -hmm. created for your talk at Georgia. And so we'll have that. And um, is there a way that people can follow you on social media or? Yeah, follow me on LinkedIn um, at Savannah Young or at Savannah S. Young. Anyway, I'm on, I'm on LinkedIn and uh, you should be able to find me. And I'll put this up here. Well, thank you all so much for watching and you all have a great rest of your day.